Okay. The phrase unequally yoked. I did not even have this topic until late last night. I wasn't even sure what I was going to talk about. And then I get it. And then now it's turned into like many different conversations because I didn't realize it meant so many different things. But the phrase unequally yoked comes from 2 Corinthians 6.14, which in the NIV translation of the Bible says, Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? The New American Standard Version says, Do not be bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness, or what fellowship has light with darkness? The King James Version also uses the verb yoked. A yoke is a wooden bar that connects two oxen to each other and to the burden that they pull. An unequally yoked team has one stronger ox and one weaker or one taller and one shorter. The weaker or the shorter ox will walk more slowly than the taller or the stronger one, causing the burden to go around in circles. So when the oxen are unequally yoked, they cannot perform the task set before them because instead of working together, they are at odds with one another so in the same way as followers of Jesus, we cannot be peaceful, God-pleasing, or in any kind of a relationship that works with an unbeliever because there is no fellowship between light and darkness because it will just keep going around in circles. The Greek word for fellowship in this verse literally means contact or intimacy and through Paul's words, we learn that intimacy with unbelievers is not just discouraged, it is impossible. And God knows this. That's why he demanded that the Israelites marry within their faith and why he asks us to do the same, he says. It is for our own protection. Paul's warning in 2 Corinthians 6.14 is part of, part of a larger sermon to the church of Corinth on the Christian life. He discouraged them from being in an unequal partnership with unbelievers because believers and unbelievers are opposites, just as light and darkness are opposites. The pagan, wicked, unbelieving world is governed by the principles of Satan, and those choosing to follow Jesus should be separate from those choosing wickedness, just as Christ was separate from all the purposes, ways, and plans of the devil. He had no part in them, he formed no relationships with them, and his followers should not form relationships with them either. Attempting to live a Christian life with a non-Christian as an ally and a close friend will cause us to go around in circles. There are many Bible verses about being unequally yoked, whether in business or in relationships, and Christians are not to be unequally yoked with unbelievers, according to the Bible. Starting a business with an unbeliever can put a Christian in a terrible situation and at a terrible disadvantage. And most of us who have been Christians and around business for any length of time have seen this quite a few times. It can cause Christians to compromise and oftentimes simply to save the business. There have been, um, there will be many disagreements, fast money decisions that cause many to lose their integrity, their inner peace, and at many times much more is lost. Um, in these cases, what is assumed upon is you're a Christian, you should be the one to act decent, is often what is said. Um, the, the Christian person is expected to be the one to act like a decent person. So they're the one that gives in first. If you're thinking about doing this, going into business with a non-believer, I wouldn't do it. If you're thinking about dating or marrying an unbeliever, definitely don't do it. 
Many have done it before you and they're definitely sorry that they did. I've met many of them. You can easily be led astray and it definitely will hinder your relationship with Christ. The ones who suffer the most are the children. And I've watched this happen for many years. Most of those that I have watched marry non-believers have very little, uh, if any, appearance of faith in their lives at this point, and they don't keep in contact with the passionate believers that they once knew or once hung around with. They are well aware of the sacrifice that they made. They know that they gave up Jesus. They are well aware of that. They don't say that because they don't want to say that, but they are well aware of that. Um, they don't keep in contact because they know why they don't keep in contact. They don't call and say these things, but we all know why they don't call and say these things. Don't think that you will get married and you will change them because that rarely happens and it will most likely cause more problems if you think that because they become very resentful if you try to do that. And I can rarely think of one when asked because when people say that I need to reach them or I need to this or I need to that, I often tell them this and they become, when that conversation gets urgent, I try to tell them I, can, I can't even think of one where they have actually done that. It becomes kind of a frantic conversation, but rarely can I think of one where someone actually has won them over to Christ where they haven't paid an incredible price. We must deny ourselves and take up our cross daily and sometimes you have to drop relationships for Christ. Don't think that you know what's best because in these cases your thinking is truly selfish, especially in this case. You have to trust in God alone, not in yourself. There are so many reasons to not marry an unbeliever and not to date an unbeliever. You have to wait on God's timing and trust in his ways, especially when dating and when you're deciding who to marry. This is what the Bible says, Amos 3.3. 3. Do two walk together unless they have agreed to meet? 2 Corinthians 6.14. Don't team up with those who are unbelievers. How can righteousness be a partner with wickedness? How can light live with darkness? Ephesians 5, 7, therefore do not become partners with them. 2 Corinthians 6, 15, what harmony is there between Christ and Belial? Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? 2 Corinthians 6, 17, therefore come out from among them and be ye separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing and I will receive you. Isaiah 52, 11, depart, depart, go out from there. Touch no unclean thing. Come out from it and be pure, you who carry the articles of the Lord's house. 2 Corinthians 6, 16, what agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. 1 Corinthians 6, 16-17 Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said, the two will become one flesh. For whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Proverbs six twenty seven: Can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Proverbs 6, 28, can one go upon hot coals and his feet not be burned? Over and over in the Bible, we see this point repeated. Samson repeatedly sought out unbelieving women, and this eventually destroyed him. Solomon was known as the wisest man in the world until his many wives led him to worship other gods at the end of his life. And sadly, uh, it is not clear. Um, it is not clear what happens to Solomon even at the end of his life. It is, it is a little hazy eternally what happens with Solomon. It's a very big price to pay when you let sexual immorality take out a legacy like Solomon had. Creating relationships with people who do not love, follow, or submit to Christ is direct disobedience. Intimacy, intimacy is impossible without spiritual unity. 
if Jesus Christ is truly king of our lives, we should be completely submitted in our deepest hearts to his control. How then can we unite intimately with someone who is in rebellion against God? Clearly, this cannot happen. One will pull the other to their side, and it will nearly always be the one who gave in first, the weakest link. And this upsets people when you try to tell them that their dating relationship is likely to cost them their faith. They instantly defend their date as having character beyond what most Christians can even match. They will tell you how respectful, sweet, and loving this unbeliever is. They will even paint them as a believer. But the facts are they're not a believer. They're at odds with Christ. They are in rebellion. I can often go to their Facebook page and I can point out clearly that person is definitely not a believer in Jesus Christ because if they were, the evidence would be there. They are not a Christian. If someone were a believer in Jesus Christ, I can guarantee you there would not be F words on their Facebook page. There would not be profanity on their Facebook page. That would be one strong indicator. There would be a lot of things not on their Facebook page that are there because they know that they are a representative and ambassador of the King of Kings and they would not have things on that page that would make people disillusioned. The Facebook page itself is a strong indicator of who you represent. I go there right away. Many employers go there right away. A lot of people go to the Facebook page or social media right away. So people know that that is a strong indicator of who you are. Whether people like it or not, that is a strong indicator of who you are. No relationship apart from Christ can be truly good. No love apart from Christ can be true love. It may look like these things from the outside, but will never be unified within. Your body is a sanctuary of worship for the King, for we are a temple of the living God. And as God has said, I will live with them, walk among them, I will be their God, and they will be my people. And if that is true about you, people can see that, they can feel that, and when you walk, people know that about you. They know that because you live a certain way, you do certain things, you don't do a lot of things. There is a way that you live, a way that you talk, a way that you are, that you represent the King of Kings. It also says, therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing, and I will receive you. 2 Corinthians 6, 16 to 17. Your body is the new temple, and as a follower of Christ, the Spirit of God dwells in you. And this is why God calls us to come out from among them and be separate. He's not telling us to be unloving. We're called to be loving. We're called to love unbelievers, 1 Peter 2.12. And God is calling us to love him more than them. He calls us to love him more. So we can love unbelievers, but we have to love him more than we love unbelievers. Therefore, we don't get to date unbelievers because we love them more, we have to love him more. He's calling us to be a place of worship. So if we choose them first over him, we've made our choice. This is a call to reconsider our view of God and dating. God cares about our relationships because he cares about us. He cares about our purity because that is what keeps us in relationship with him. Our holiness preaches the gospel louder than our words, so we get to choose. If we choose not to be holy, then 
We're choosing not to be his. It's clear with him. Holiness is a mandate to be his. Unequal yoking hinders our walk with God, the one thing we need more than anything else. We need our relationship with him more than any relationship with anyone else. And those who have made the mistake of choosing wrong have found out how much they needed God once they were suffering the painful situation and the heartbreak that came from making the wrong choice. For those who love Jesus and so badly want a relationship, and they search to find someone who says that they also love Jesus because many of us have made that mistake, and trust me, you can find people who will say they love Jesus to have the relationship, but it's pretty clear they love Jesus differently than we love Jesus. But we feel that's okay because at least they're a Christian, or they say they're a Christian. Everything will be okay, won't it? Let me speak to you from the only one that it matters to, the one that holds our life in his hands, the one that you're choosing the relationship over the relationship that matters. As Christians, it is important that we choose to be with someone that strengthens our relationship with God, not someone that would influence us to disobey, hesitate, be spiritually lazy, or feel inhibited from honoring or praising God in any way. Remember, your body belongs to God until you are married. If anyone places their hands on you before they marry you, God did not send them. They have chosen to disrespect both God and you. If they are willing to do that before marriage, they certainly will after you are married. And I'd be very cautious moving forward. Ladies, a man who has no honor for God is not someone you want as your spiritual leader. And men, a woman who is verbally disrespectful, dishonoring, and unwilling to submit to your authority, you need to move on as well. I get many calls with issues that don't even need to be called about, and these two are most of them. People having sex before they're married, men who are being berated by women, women who are being abused by men, all of them need to break up. God is in none of these relationships. He doesn't want any of these people together, and there is nothing but heartache ahead. All of them need to break up. Don't even ask for advice. There is nothing good that's going to come from them. Break up, do it right the next time, choose purity, and respect the next time. Who we choose as a spouse is the most clear picture we can give anyone about who we are. God doesn't want us to be with someone if the relationship keeps us from being close to him. Even if the person says they are a Christian, goes to church and does all the Christian things, but really is not hungry for God, he wants us to be in a relationship where both people draw closer to him as a result of loving him. Now, regarding business relationships, the unequal yoke is often applied to business relationships also. For a Christian to enter into a partnership with an unbeliever is simply to ask for a disaster. Unbelievers have opposite worldviews and morals, and business decisions made daily will reflect the worldview of one partner or the other. There's no other way around it. For the relationship to work, one or the other will reflect the morals and yield to the other. There's Someone's going to have to give because these are opposite systems. More often than the other, it's going to be the believer that is pressured into giving up their principles for the sake of profit and growth of the business. And these are some verses that will tell you not to be yoked together with unbelievers and that evil company corrupts good habits. Proverbs 13, 20, He who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companion of fools will be destroyed. Proverbs 14, 6, A scoffer seeks wisdom and does not find it, 
but knowledge is easy to him who understands. Go from the presence of a foolish man when you do not perceive in him the lips of knowledge. Philippians 3, 2, beware of dogs, beware of evil workers. 2 Thessalonians 3, 6, but we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly and not according to the tradition which he received from us. Romans 16, 17, now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned and avoid them. For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly and by smooth words and flattering speech deceive the hearts of the simple. 1 Corinthians 15, 33, do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Awake to righteousness and do not sin, for some do not have the knowledge of God. All of these verses are giving us a major warning that we have to stay away from all who are choosing to align with the world in this life and who will do nothing but try to bring us down to a different standard of living, but definitely a lower standard of living. Business and friendships with the world commonly share five attributes which are hostile to God. One, they are commonly in favor of sexual immorality. Sexual immorality is at the top of almost every list of sin in the New Testament, and it's emphasized in the book of Revelation as one of Satan's primary weapons against the church in the end times. So many references to that, I won't even list them. They're easy to find. If someone is continually and habitually engaging in sexual immorality and calling themselves a Christian, they're seriously deceived. God condemns all forms of sexual sin, including pornography. If there's any kind of sexual sin, I hear many that feel that if they're uh, singularly sinning sexually using digital media or some other kind of where they're alone, not with a partner, and they think somehow that they're avoiding accountability that way, they're wrong. Sexual sin in any form is sexual sin. It doesn't matter if someone attends some school of ministry, speaks in tongues, prophesies, a mega preacher, if they believe in false grace teaching, it does not matter. If one is having sex not designed as God has designed it within marriage, they have sold themselves to the devil. They are going for eternity in hell unless they repent and fully turn from this wickedness. God demands purity in this area and he will not accept any excuses. He will not accept any excuses, period. Jesus Christ paid with his life for this wickedness. I am urgent that people listen because I hear so many different excuses. Repentance is turning from wickedness, turning, not, not, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It is turning from wickedness. I was guilty. I was guilty of sexual sin. I had to turn from sin. I had to repent and turn. I was forgiven. You must lay down your sin and repent and turn. You have to stop. You have to lay down your sin and stop. Jesus paid for your sin. It's that simple in the Bible. You have to leave your sin to be forgiven. To another common issue that is that the world is um that is common with um um friendships with the world is drunkenness there's steady pressure in the worldly culture that is infiltrated um and that is drunkenness and casual drinking drunkenness paul warns in ephesians 5 18 do not get drunk on wine which leads to, to debauchery instead be filled with the spirit and I've seen this. Um, I know many in ministry who feel that drunkenness, drinking drunkenness is acceptable. I'm not going to argue with drinking, but drunkenness is a sin, period. Um, it, it trips up so many. I just, I beg for those who are weaker, I beg on their behalf to please not expose younger people and weaker people to this. It's it creates so many victims for so many different reasons, um, sexually and otherwise. I just, 
I cringe when I hear that drinking is going on in the ministry. I just, I know that I will keep everyone in my care away from any ministry that allows drinking. Three, tolerance. There will be a twisting of what the Bible says and a spirit of perversion that will fill and allow for wickedness and compromise in the church. I could write for days on what I'm told by those in the church about what should be acceptable. Those in the world have more of a sense of what's right and wrong anymore than the church. It's a sad day for the church anymore on what they are willing to tolerate and what they speak about. People with out the spirit of religion have a better sense of what's right and wrong. I would rather speak to them about this anymore. For the love of money, 1 Timothy 6.10 says, but if, if it's only money in the Message Bible, but if it's only money these leaders are after, they'll self-destruct in no time. Lust for money brings trouble and nothing but trouble. Going down that path, some lose their footing in the faith completely and live to regret it bitterly ever after. Many are governed by their love of money. They will sacrifice the truth of the gospel for pleasure and entertainment. Enough said. Five, pride. James 4, 6 says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Prideful people hate criticism. Don't even try to criticize them. They're insecure. They don't even know how to accept any kind of, um, they can't accept any kind of, any kind of, even any kind of criticism. They crave praise. They have to be told how important they are. They cannot bear not getting credit for everything that they feel they've accomplished. They have an insatiable need to be told how important they are. The Bible tells us that we are not to be unequally yoked and that with unbelievers and that we are to stay away from people who cause divisions and offenses and to withdraw from every brother who walks unruly. But this does not mean that we cannot work with the lost, the broken, and the people who need to hear the message of salvation and who need to know Jesus. When Jesus came to earth, he always went out after the sinners and those who were shunned by others and had he would had the express purpose of finding them to help them to be saved and restored but he did not pursue everyone he was very hard on the religious leaders and he but he stayed away from those who he considered evil workers and dogs as he called them one of the first things that god will do when you surrender your life to him as he will start to put boundary lines around you he will start to lead you towards certain jobs he will start to lead you towards certain people and he will want to as you would as a good parent he will want you to have certain friends as long as you are willing he will try to put the right things around you he wants you to be transformed. He wants to mold you into the image of his son. He will want to guide you towards the right spouse if you are willing. But if you are not willing, he will withdraw and he will let you rebel against him and pull away. And he will let you pull away. He will let you start to go out and tear up your life and get in as much trouble as you're willing to get yourself into, which I would strongly suggest you not do. Some of us have done that. And we have found ourselves in a world of hurt because we refuse to submit to the protective hand of God. And he has had to pull it back because we won't have it. We just think we know better and we want what we want, and we're willing to endure a truckload of pain, it's shameful how much we want to rebel against God. It's amazing that we're still alive, to be honest. It's amazing that he actually still stayed with us in spite of our wicked selves. 
that he continued to bear with us. I'm amazed at my own life that God endured with me through so much rebellion, even after my salvation. There's another part of this that I want to go into that I realized the verse talked about um, unequally yoked with unbelievers. But we were discussing this after I got here and I told them the subject of being unequally yoked. But there's a major piece of this about being unequally yoked with believers once you get to a point where you're in the faith and then you find yourself with those in the faith who start to really mess up your life too and you have to start drawing some lines there and I would say in the last probably four years I am I can't even put wrap my head around the amount of suffering in my life from believers just from the shock and the just from problems that just kind of hit me sideways from you have to be really careful the believers that you align yourself with the people that you trusted that you thought that you trusted that you felt like that you could trust and and you couldn't trust them so i just want to say that you can't there's a there's a aligning don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers but then when you become a believer i would say to be very careful about being unequally yoked with with believers as well there's another whole layer of wisdom that needs to be used there as well as far as like when we started this ministry even well even in my previous ministry there's there's just a whole nother conversation there that I will never have but things that happen there that are that I will never speak about that are just really hard to understand but then even starting this ministry, people who came, you know, alongside of us that were already in ministries that offered things or, you know, brought things to us that we later found out were deceptive or, you know, certainly trickery that you know, a lot of times we were shocked. We were so shocked because we just weren't expecting that. We just weren't expecting that from these people. We just, they probably, you know, saw us as, you know, women who really didn't know what we were doing and would be easy targets. I'm sure that's what they thought. Had not God protected us, we would have, we would have really been wiped out by them we a number this would have happened probably four times at least so we had miraculous intervention a few times and so i just i would just say that there's there needs to be wisdom on the christian side of this too that when you're dating when you're dating to get married also you need to be using great wisdom when you're dating Christians because you're going to want to use wisdom. There's many degrees of what professions of Christianity are now in the church. So you'll want to really have help with that i would say you'll want leaders around you helping you don't don't just um rush into anything anymore so i just um i just know that 
there's so much to say about this subject now unequally yoked there's just so much to lose on that on a much wider scale than just unbelievers there's a very wide topic on that with believers too that you would want to take into consideration also that you just want to be very very careful and use a lot of wisdom on all levels with that so i just say that always keep um close companions never be a lone ranger christian always have um always keep um close friends it's always good to have a close group of people i would never do it without that anymore so that you at least have agreement in prayer so that god can always if he doesn't if you can't get clarity at least he can come through one of your peers i don't know how to do it any other way so um i just want to say too that we sure appreciate hearing from people i know that we've been really blessed by many of you reaching out to us and um and i just want to just thank everyone for um we just really appreciated our the people that have been there for us so precious lord thank you for you've really been amazing to to our ministry the way you have protected us this has really brought back a lot to me just this subject has really made me reflect on how protective you've been to us and to the women here to myself just the many many times you have guarded us and helped us in spite of ourselves even the times that we just didn't even see something coming and I just thank you for um, just your amazing grace to me all my life even in my own just carelessness and my own rebellion your amazing grace to me that you you just cared to continue on with me that you just tarried with me in spite of myself you just tarried with me all those years thank you for giving me so many chances year after year after year you just tarried with me now here we are thank you for loving me enough to wait and wait and wait and wait i just abandoned myself to you and thank you for every single day that you give me that I can continue to just scream how grateful I am from the rooftops and just declare my awe of you and how amazing you are and how full of mercy you are. And I pray that you would right now reach out to everyone who is listening if they are stuck god in any relationship or any any sin that they just feel stuck like i did for so long that you would just loose them right now in the name of jesus i just pray that by your Holy Spirit, you would touch them right now and loose them in the name of Jesus. That you would help them like you did me. You did it so fast that you would give them the want to right now to just let go and choose Jesus over themselves and their own desires. That they would just let go and choose Christ. Thank you that you are so much more than anything we would ever let go of, that there is just nothing greater than you and what you have in exchange for anything we would have to lay down. I ask that you would just cover everyone with the blood of Jesus and help them to feel what forgiven feels like that you would just cover them all with the blood of Jesus Christ. Let them know what just purity feels like right now for a moment. 
Let them feel forgiven. Let them know what that's like so they can just grab that and hang on and just know it's worth it. I just declare Jesus Christ as Lord over everyone who would hear this. And I thank you, Jesus, that you will have your way in each life, that you will start a fire that will never burn out, that it will start now and it will blaze from now till eternity, that every life will never be the same. I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.